Welcome to the Faith Dialogue Podcast with your host, Pastor Ken Baer. Are you ready to swim in the deep end of the Bible pool or climb to the top of Faith Mountain? If so, open the eyes that see, those ears that hear, and a heart that is receptive. Get your cup of coffee and your Bible as we begin. We pray, and then we're going to get into uh, the parable of the lost son. Again. And again, because we actually talked about this a few months ago when it was in Matthew. We're going to be doing it in Luke. So I thought I'd change it up a little bit. Okay. Ask some different questions this time. Good. It's sure. always, always fun. Yeah. So let, let me pray. Father God, we want to thank you again this morning. We thank you, Lord, that we can gather together. We know that any time we open up uh, our Bibles and start talking about you and talking about uh, what the words in red say, those are the parables. Lord, we know that we're blessed because of that. So we just pray that you give us wisdom, give us ears to hear, and we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hey, Jim. Jimbo, come and join us. So let me flip over here. We're in the Gospel of Luke, starting in the 15th chapter. Jimbo, sit right here. Take a seat right there. Hi, Jimbo. Hello. There you go. Thank you. So again, today we're talking about the parable of the lost son, which is also called the parable of the prodigal son. You've heard, you've heard the word prodigal son before. Yes, prodigal yes, prodigal yes. means somebody that has been lost and is returning. A prodigal is actually somebody that comes back. We don't use the word very often in English, but people do know this, this parable by that name, the prodigal son. So let me read it to you, and then we'll talk about it, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna, the context, remember, of all three of these parables, we had the lost coin, remember? We had the lost son, and the third one is the lost sheep. So all three of these come as a response to the Pharisees saying something to Jesus. In chapter 15, verse 1, it says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him, meaning Jesus, to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them saying, and he actually spoke three parables, three parables in response to the Pharisees saying, oh, (laughs) the sinners are coming to him. He's he's actually touching them. He's talking with them. They're they're low class. He should know that they're not worthy of speaking to somebody that's holy. So Jesus said to them, this is starting in verse 11, a certain man had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided his, them to his, his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed the swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants." And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry." For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to his house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf." 
But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I've never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as the son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is now found. So it's a, it's a neat parable, and most of us are aware of the, the story, the, the story of this, this man that, that takes his inheritance and goes and wastes it, and a famine comes and finds himself starving. Nobody's going to give him anything, so he goes back to his father. So there's actually three different characters in this story. We've talked about this. We see the, the son himself, the younger son, we see the father, and then at the end of the parable, there's the story of the older brother. And we can actually take a few weeks, and we've done that, mm -hmm. and spend time on each one of these pieces because there's a lot that is going on there. But I, but I told you that, that when we look at the parables, we're going to look at it through the eyes of what Jesus told us, which was these parables are told to us so that some of us, not everybody, but some of us would understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. So because it's the kingdom of heaven, these are all kingdom prophecies. These are all kingdom parables. So the idea is that we can see the king in here. And I think it's pretty obvious. Most of us would say we can see that the father is the one that is acting most like God. He is, he's happy to receive his son back. He doesn't hold back. He forgives him. He treats him like he had never left, which is a wonderful way of looking at it. It really is. The one thing I wanted to show you today that's a little different than I've showed you before, and I think you'll like this, mm -hmm. is that so often when we read the Bible, mm -hmm. we read it through our eyes, meaning that we have, you've heard this, the saying, rose-colored glasses. Yeah. A person that has rose-colored glasses is always looking at things as if it's rosy. <laughs> things are good. And sometimes nice. people say, oh, you're looking through at things like, like you have rose-colored glasses. Everything is looking rosy. And that's true. One of the things that's almost impossible to get around is our culture. So when we take a look at anything that we see, whether it's on TV or we read a story or we read a Bible passage like this, we interpret it from our perspective. Sure. So what's our perspective? Our perspective is the Western cultures, right? Mm -hmm. European cultures, you know, Aristotle and, and Plato and American culture. And we take a look at it from our perspective as a Western culture. We've grown up in church. You've been to many, many churches. So when you, when you look at things, you're putting it into perspective of your, your churches and your cultures. And I'll show you how easy it is to read that into the parable sometimes without even thinking. So the question I have for you is this, is we know that there was this lost son that, was, that needed to be saved. He was in a deplorable condition. So the question I have for you, based on what you just, what you just read, mm -hmm. why was he in that condition before the story? Remember what I told you is that these parables typically we believe have one particular meaning. And the meaning I think we can drill into pretty quickly. We see the heart of God uh, represented in the Father who is willing to forgive right. and, and restore to full status. I mean, it doesn't have studies. He's full status, right? So God is always willing to do that. And this is a great, a great parable that points to the heart of God. And we see that quickly. The question I ask, though, is this man, this man talked about in this parable that took his inheritance and then went into a different land. Why was he, why was he in this condition? And there's actually three possibilities. Well, he allowed himself to be in it. But why, what did he do? He spent all of his money, Yeah. right? Yeah. So, so here's, I'll give you some hints. But why is he in the position he's in? There, why was okay. he, why okay. was he in that position? I thought you what did. happened to him? Why did because he? Because he left, he left, he left the presence of God. Okay. He to be in the world. That's one too. Yeah. So, so here's, here's what, the reason I'm saying this is this, is that 
as we travel around the world, remember it's the same gospel around okay. the world. If you ask that question that I asked you, why was the prodigal lost? People in America will say, well, it's because he spent all of his possessions. He wasted all of his money, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is in verse 13. Mm -hmm. He wasted all of his money. So if you ask an American culture, why was the prodigal lost and needed to come back? They would say it's because he wasted his possessions. Okay. If you ask the same question in Africa, in Africa, mm -hmm. they would say, you would say, why was this man lost and needed to come back? They would say, well, it says in verse 14, there arose a great famine. Right, so he had nothing. See, so they, in Africa, yeah. they understand famines. If a famine comes, I don't care how much money you've got. I don't care whether you're rich or poor. You're going to be hungry. You're going to be hungry. Because a famine changes everything, right? Yeah. If you ask the same question to a group of Christians in China, in China, and don't you know that many of our, of our statisticians, the people that are, that are keeping track of things within Christianity. They believe we actually have more Bible-believing Christians now in China than there are oh, in the United yes. States. Because yeah. oh, there's 1.3, 1.4 billion people, and there's underground churches, and there's hundreds of millions of Christians that are undergoing persecution, but there's hundreds of millions of Christians. So if you ask this question, the parable of the lost son, why is he lost? And why is he in such a horrible shape that he has to come back to his father? They would say, well, it says in verse 16 that no one would give him anything. Yeah. No, because everything was gone. It's, he had a lot of money, yeah. but he squandered it in the world. He buy a lot yeah. of things that wasn't necessary. He lived his life in, in um, abundance. Exactly. And then it wasted. So I said there's, there's possibly one of three, possibly four mm. answers yeah. to the question. Yeah. So if you're American... Often you would say, well, it's because he wasted his money. We see that in the scriptures. If you're from Africa or a place that understands famine, famines will come, and they'll say, well, it's because there was a famine in the land. It didn't matter whether he spent his money before or last, because when the famine comes, he's going to lose it all anyway. Sure. And if people are in a collective environment like China or Venezuela or Cuba, they would say, well, it's because nobody would give him anything. See, there were people that could share, but he would, nobody was giving him anything. But I like your response, sister, because actually that's the fourth. And the fourth option is that he left his father's estate. You see, you see at the end, he realized at the end, that the servants were... Um, well, the, well, the father says it. The father says, he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. You see, the point is this, is this prodigal son that wanted his, his inheritance so that he could spend it. After he received his inheritance from his father, did he have more or less than he had before? He actually had less. Really? Because he separated himself from his from father. father. So oh, he yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, it wasn't so. He still have everything because his father still think that still give him everything when he came home. That's more. right. So yeah. when he came back, he had everything. So yeah. so here's here's one of the kingdom principles. One of the kingdom principles is that God provides for all, all of, of our needs. God provides oh. all of our needs. In Psalm twenty three, it says, you know. I, the good shepherd I shall not want I shall not want we have so with God we understand that truly in the truest sense of the world not so much what we can touch or feel right, right, okay right. not this temporal world right. that's that's subject to famines and earthquakes and problems and calamities but actually in the kingdom we are joint heirs with Jesus yes. we are sons of the living God we are wow. joint heirs with Jesus, which means that all the Father has is ours. And, and, and what's interesting is that when, when this prodigal son actually separated himself from the Father, what happens is this, is he actually loses out. Yeah. He actually, even though he thinks he gets something more, he actually gets less. He this gets is the less. Prodigal. This, this is the son that went away. The son yes. that went away. So when well, he when he goes away, he thinks he's actually got something. Oh, right, right. Okay. But this, his source is limited. Now the only thing he has to rely on is what he's carrying in yes. his bag, what yes. he is able to produce himself. When he stayed with his father, sure. everything sure. the father had was his. He 
sure. could have had it all. He could have had it all. Because um, when he came to the realization after he got hungry and was eating the pig food, uh -huh. he said, well, wait, my, my father treat the, the servants better than this. Yep. They have meal, they have bed, they have coverage, and why should I sit here and, and, and suffer? I'm going back to my father, and I'm just going to ask him to, to, to hire me as one of the servants. Exactly right. So he, he repented. I get converted and went back. That's right. Which is this and he was, church. and the thing was, is that the the father gave him even more than he more. was asking for. Yes. Because yes. he was he was coming back, yes. and yes. all he wanted to do is just just treat me like a slave. Yes. Like a slave. And he said, like no, no. Servant. Father says, no. I'm restoring you. Bring him the ring of approval, a robe of righteousness, mm -hmm. and accept him and have a party for him. Now the one that was in the church, which represent the people in the church, he got angry. Yeah. He came and heard that. The brother that took everything went away. He comes back, and he's getting all this glory. Nope, he went away. Yeah, and maybe he's lost. Forever. Exactly right. Maybe because he got angry and never returned. Jesus, Jesus was telling this story. Remember, in response to the Pharisees questioning Jesus on why he would be associating with sinners, and you see the Pharisees' response. The Pharisees' response would have been if there's if a son would have come back, if a Judah, of a son, if a son of Judah would have come back after doing this, spending his money on harlots and doing yes. horrible things, the father would probably do one of two things. He would take off his shoe and throw it at his son, or he would take his robe and he would rip his robe apart, and he would say, I would have no son, my son is dead. That was a typical, at the time of Christ, that was a typical response for a father whose son had either defrauded him or had shamed him. If a son had shamed him, he would rip his clothes, he would rip his shirt, and basically say, I have no son. You see, the, the Pharisees would be expecting that even if the, this prodigal son would return, that he would be rejected oh, yeah. by the father. That's, yeah. and, that's, and that's why this story that Jesus is telling is so important, because as people that have grown up in the church, and we've spent time in the church, we're taught that we are to forgive. That the heart of God is always to forgive. When Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive? Up to seven times. Jesus says, no, 70 times seven. And then gives us the story of, of remember that? Of, of, the, of, the, of the good Samaritan. Of the man that went out and was almost dead, half dead. And the Pharisees passed by. Or the priest went set by. The Levite passed by. And the Samaritan was able to take him in. So we're taught these stories now. So we know the right response. The point of these parables is not to know the right response to say it, but to internalize it, yeah. to, have it in, to have it in your heart. Because Jesus is telling us that we need to have this kind of heart, yeah. the heart of the Father. There's three people in this, in this parable. We want to be like one of them. The one we want to be like is the Father who is willing to forgive, who is willing to restore. We're not to be like the prodigal son that takes his inheritance. What a, what a horrible thing to do, by the way, to come to somebody and ask for your inheritance. I mean, inheritance is given after you after die. That, you know, people are asking for it before because they're falling into so much um, mess that they said, can I get my inheritance now? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's... There, in a way, um, that the prodigal son turns out to be better than the one that was at home. Well, that's right. Because well, he's at least fully restored. Yes, yes. His his attitude was, is yes. just receiving. We don't we don't have a lot of conversation with the prodigal son. In fact, after he says, "I'm not worthy to be your son," right. we don't hear anything more from him. Hopefully, he's learned his lesson. Yes, and exactly and we're hoping that the older son as well, after he after he hears yes. the father, after the father pleads for him to come back and join the party. Then maybe he thinks again and yeah. realizes that yeah. he needs to be it able to, to honor yes. his yes. father. Yes. Well, Billy, you would have liked this because we were talking about the prodigal son. So let me just recap for Billy yeah, and, sure. and the rest of us. So we've been talking about the prodigal son and it's one of the three parables that we see in the Gospel of Luke. So we've talked about it before, but I changed it up a little bit this time. Okay. Because one of the things I said is that I asked the question, um, from your perspective of this parable, don't apply anything else to it, but from the, your perspective of what you read, why was this son in the shape? Why did he need to be saved? What happened to him? 
And the way I, what I explained was this, is that if you're coming from a Western perspective, a Western US type perspective, we would say, well, it's obvious because in, in that one verse, what is it, verse 10, it says, it's a verse 13, it says, he wasted his possessions. Mm -hmm. And here, that's, that's a horrible thing to do. We're supposed to, be a, we're supposed to save our money and save something yeah. for a rainy day. If you were, however, in Africa and asked the same question, the response would often be, well, you see in verse 14, it says there's a famine in the land. And people in Africa know what happens with the famine. It doesn't matter rich or poor, you're going to be awfully hungry. And then if you ask somebody in China, and there's millions of Christians in China, why was this man lost? They would say, well, because no one would give him anything. You see, it's a collective society where they share things. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it's very interesting. So it's just kind of an interesting way of, of looking at that. I don't know if they've actually <laughs> yes. done statistics on that, but it's something I spotted. Yeah, but again, the way we would conclude this is the parable, the true meaning in the parable is understand that the Father, God, yeah. has a heart that's always willing to forgive and to restore. Amen. And the comment was oh, yeah. is that the main problem that this young man had was that he decided to leave his father's estate. And here's That's the thing, right my there, friends, so. is there's nothing better than being close to God uh -huh. because God will provide all of your needs according to the riches that are in Christ Jesus. Uh -huh. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do a few, a few things. You can do a couple of things. <laughs> Billy's shaking his head. You can do nothing. Nothing. You can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This man thought he was actually getting something when he got his inheritance and actually he, he got, got less. less. Yes. Yeah. He got less because he the only like thing this. that was he left like was his own resources. Yeah. So it's a great story. Amazing story. It's a great story. So let's let's pray and we'll we'll go from there. So Father God, we want to thank you, Lord. You are you are so good to us. You're just an amazing God. We thank you, Lord, for these these stories, these these parables that uh, that teach us so much. And, and we shouldn't be surprised because these are the words in red. Lord, I've, I love reading the words in red, these words of Jesus, uh, just because it allows us to understand a little bit more about God's heart towards us. And we give you all the praise and the glory for that. In Jesus. You've been listening to Faith Dialogue with Pastor Ken Baer, recorded live at Celebrate Seniors, a ministry of faith dialogue. You can listen to or watch all of the recordings at Faith Dialogue by going to www.faithdialogue.org.